Welcome back to Module 5 and welcome to Chapter 23. In this first video from this particular chapter, we are going to focus on how low mass stars like the Sun die. In order to have a complete conversation about those low mass stars, we are also going to include something that can happen if they are in a binary system. That way we have a full understanding of the different things that can happen to low mass stars. So let's start with a reminder of what we've talked about so far from the previous chapter. The sun is going to leave the main sequence when it can no longer turn hydrogen into helium in its core. As it leaves the main sequence to become a red giant, it will go through a short phase of helium to carbon fusion. In this particular image that we saw in the previous chapter, from point B on this track to about point C is when helium to carbon fusion is able to happen in the core. We call it the triple alpha process. But at some point that runs out too. At that time then, the sun will have a core that is filled with carbon that is not producing energy and so gravity is kind of winning out. That core will continue to contract. And because it will heat up as it contracts, the outer layers are going to expand because the pressure from that much, the gas pressure from that much hotter core is going to cause them to get larger and larger and kind of puff up. Until at some point for a low mass star like the sun, the outer layers actually just continue to expand until they kind of disconnect from the star and become a planetary nebula. So the outer layers of low mass stars like the sun can become planetary nebula. They look very pretty in all of these diagrams. I do need to point out that these diagrams are multi-wavelength, which means they aren't necessarily what our eyes would be able to see, but they are showing real structures and those colors have meaning. But one thing to be aware of is that all of these weird different shapes are mostly just a difference of perspective from the same overall process, where all of this material is leaving the star either in a somewhat spherical fashion or as two lobes, kind of like part B shows from the side. But we might be able to look straight down at... Um, the kind of column of all of this happening and we get something like the helix nebula or ring nebula like part A on the left here. So the outer layers of a sun-like star create this planetary nebula but then they leave behind the exposed core which is now extremely hot and extremely small because it's been contracting this whole time. When the outer layers leave, the exposed core now gets a new name, and it's called a white dwarf. We have mentioned this before, and now we can start to put it together with our big picture understanding that a white dwarf is a leftover core of what used to be a somewhat low mass star. The white dwarf balances gravity with a different type of pressure. It's called electron degeneracy pressure. And I do need us to understand at least a little bit of what that means, not the full physics equations behind it, but the fact that the electron part of that term, electron degeneracy pressure, means that all of the atoms, the electrons are kind of up against each other, the electron clouds. It's kind of like if you had a room full of balloons, the balloons themselves, the kind of outer surface of the balloons are kind of like the electron cloud, and there might be a tiny little thing in the middle of the balloon, we're imagining a nucleus there, that is the rest of the atom, but we're collecting all of the balloons, and even though there's lots of air still, they can only get so close together. And if you squash on them a little bit more, more gravity, they actually get a little bit smaller. That's what the degeneracy part here means, is that as you add more mass, the white dwarf gets smaller and not bigger. It goes kind of against what we might imagine. And if we plotted all of those different possible sizes, there's something important to note here. First of all, a radius of 0 0.01 solar radii means it's about a hundredth the size across of the sun. The earth is about a hundredth the size of acro across of the sun. Which means that white dwarfs, if we need to have like a quick memory aid to, to, 
distinguish how big they are, they're roughly the size of Earth. But they have masses comparable to the sun. Our own sun will leave behind a white dwarf that is about half of its mass. That is not true for all stars. It's not always half and half, but that's just kind of how it works out for the sun. But as we add more mass to these white dwarfs, it gets smaller and smaller until it looks like there is a radius equal to zero. That's a problem. That is the absolute upper limit to a white dwarf. If we go back to our quick balloon analogy, if we're holding on to all of those white dwarfs and we push a little bit too hard, those balloons will pop. That's what we mean by the radius going to zero. Something bad will happen to all of the atoms that are part of that white dwarf if we go past that mass limit. Gravity would get too strong. So the Chandrasekhar limit, although we don't need to derive where that number comes from, we do need to recognize that there is a maximum value for the mass that a white dwarf can have. Now, I mentioned before, a one solar mass star makes about half of a solar mass worth of white dwarf, and it's roughly eight or ten solar masses um, where that star will leave behind a core that is right around that mass limit. So that means that a star that was originally more than 8 or 10, the number is a, um, a little bit contested, um, it won't leave behind a w white dwarf or planetary nebula. Something else will happen to it entirely. That will be our next video, is what happens to stars that are more than 10 solar masses. But first, what I want us to talk about is what can happen to a white dwarf that is able to form like normal, the single star going through the end of its life, the planetary nebula, outer layers, and then the core becomes a white dwarf. I want to talk about what happens if we add mass to an existing white dwarf. That doesn't just happen randomly, but that can happen in a binary system. In a binary system, each object has its own kind of sphere of influence, that if you're within that distance around those objects, then it will um, be the strongest gravitational force. If you're far enough away from both of the spheres of influence, then you can kind of orbit the whole thing as one large amount of mass. If you're interested in this, you can look up what's called Roche lobes, R-O-C-H-E, we won't be talking about them in this course. But if a star fills up its physical volume of influence, this sphere of influence, then it can actually send material to its companion. This can absolutely happen during a star's red giant phase. And the process of sharing material, uh, gaining material from your uh, binary companion is called accretion. So if a system already has a white dwarf, that second star is dumping material onto an extremely, extremely hot, dense object. And that material can just kind of go through a quick flash of surface fusion where all of the new material just fuses all at once in a bit bright flash called a nova. This can absolutely happen multiple times. If the red giant continues to send material onto that white dwarf and it's not really near the Chandrasekhar limit, then it will be able to just kind of say, no, I don't want all this new stuff and just flash fuse it very quickly. And so when we are studying stars that change their brightness, sometimes we catch Nova in that, um, in that data set, that it's a white dwarf that is only brightly flashing every so often because of a companion sending it material. However, if the second star was already kind of close to the limit, or if the white dwarf was already kind of close to the limit and the second star dumps too much matter, that is extremely bad news for the white dwarf. The entire white dwarf explodes in a type 1a supernova. So let's take a step back. I'm going to go back a slide. The naming scheme for some of the um, some of the objects that we've been talking about and will be talking about, we want to comment on. First of all, planetary nebula that we talked about at the beginning of this video, 
Planetary nebula were named because through low-powered telescopes, they kind of looked like fuzzy patches the way that planets did through te low-powered telescopes. They have nothing at all to do with planets, and the name isn't that great, but we're stuck with it. So planetary nebula, they've got nothing to do with planets except they kind of look like it if you look through a telescope, a low-powered one. A nova, a bright flash of light, once we decided to name a nova and someone discovered an extremely extra bright flash of light, they didn't want to just call it a nova again because it was so much brighter than the ones that were known, and so they called it a supernova. A type 1a supernova, the type 1 comes from the fact that it was the first identified type of supernova. But in the same way that we only talk about World War I once we had World War II and had to distinguish them, type 1a supernova for a while, while were just called supernova until we identified a type 2 for a supernova. We will be talking about type 2 supernova in the next video. But it is extremely important that we identify and possibly write down in our notes that a type 1a supernova is a white dwarf exploding when it reaches that upper mass limit. We can get into the details. We won't in this class, but if you're interested in the discussion board, we can get into the details of why it's 1a and not just 1, how some Type 1a supernova seem to be two white dwarfs that are merging. There are more complex details that we don't need for our curriculum. But the fact that it's a white dwarf at the chandra sikhar limit is extremely important for us to distinguish this type from a type 2 supernova. So I'll leave you with that for now. As always, you can rewatch these videos. You can read in the textbook um, some of these sections if it helps. And we will be exploring the other type of supernova in the next video. I'll see you then.